So uh, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our sponsors and our host committee uh, who have helped make this conference possible today. And you are, this is as much your organization as anybody, so please participate and uh, get involved. So without any further delay, um, many of you know Ted Abernathy, who will serve as the moderator for today's discussion about what technological advances may mean to the jobs that are available in the economy of the future. Ted serves as econ economic development advisor for SGA, in addition to uh, also serving as principal for his own economic development consulting firm, Economic Leadership. Uh, he brings the expertise of his 34-year 34 econo economic development career to communities, states, private sector leaders across the South, and help them plan for their economic future. Uh, Ted was born in North Carolina and received his bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, his master's from John Hopkins University, and he is also an Eisenhower Fellow for Global Economics. So, Ted, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Some of you know that uh, I do a lot of policy work for a lot of the sectors that are in the room, and I try to lean on uh, the great philosophers to try to help us figure out how we should do policy. And my favorite philosopher is Mike Tyson. He's the best philosopher that ever was. And and his best quote, and he has a bunch, but his best quote was that everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And change for a lot of southern states has been that punch. We talk to groups all the time that if you had a great idea of how your state was going to be competitive 20 years ago, that it's pretty close to worthless now because everything has been rewritten along the way. Today with this session, and I, and I want to, you, you should be in awe of the brain power up here. So I, I've told them I'm going to pick on them today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flatter them until we all pick on them. Uh, we're going to take a subject that uh, I know Dr. Walden and I, Mike and I think are, is one of the top subjects we ought to be talking about that nobody's really talking about much. And we're going we're gonna to dig into it for the next couple hours. Uh, Dr. Mike Walden is a, uh, is the Reynolds Distinguished Professor of Economics and Extension at NC State University. Mike's been there since the late 70s. He looks good, but he's been there a long time. Uh, seven books, uh, 250 articles. Uh, my favorite thing, he's my favorite economist. I, I know quite a few, and if you want to know the best economist jokes, see me at the, at the break. It involves three economists going deer hunting, and I'll be happy to tell you that one. It's a great joke. Uh, Mike is respected on both sides of the aisle in North Carolina. We have had a state that's sort of red and blue and green and purple and all sorts of things along the way. And everybody turns to Mike when they're, they're looking at things to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, daily radio show, newspaper columns. I mean, he is the most quoted economist we have in our state. And a while back, uh, we, we got to talking about some work that's been done around the world looking at what technology was going to do to our labor markets as we go forward. And uh, he's going to present to you today some data about that and some thoughts, and then we're going to ask our panel for reactions, and then we're going to try to engage the entire room in a discussion, because uh, every now and then these, th these things kind of creep up on us. And I think that's part of the new positioning of SGA is how can we help governors sort of see around that next corner on what they ought to, ought to get started on. And so with that, I hope you'll help me welcome Dr. Mike Walden. Well, thank you, Ted. Uh, first, a couple things. Uh, Governor Brashear, I grew up in Cincinnati, right across the river from Kentucky. Incidentally, Kentucky owns the Ohio River. Uh, so I feel like maybe I was actually growing up in Kentucky, too. I have relatives from Kentucky, so that's point number one. Point number two, a little levity. Ted mentioned, I'm going to have to get that joke, Ted. I, I, I collect economics jokes that you can say in proper company, of course. Yeah, I know many that are, you can't. The um, story is that um, a, a university professor decides to retire, and uh, he has a bucket list that he wants to accomplish while he's retired. Um, at the top is to go skydiving. So he signs up for lessons. He um, uh, avidly follows all the procedures. He takes several jumps where he's attached to a professional. And the day comes for him to do his solo jump. He's, he's excited, he's got his family, he's got his wife, children, grandchildren, all waiting for him at this particular site where he's supposed to land. Goes up in the plane, jumps, lands. Problem though, uh, some, something to do with the wind direction. Um, 
and he lands several miles off course. And this is a North Carolina story, so I'm gonna use tobacco. So he lands in a tobacco field in eastern North Carolina. And so the skydiver's not happy because none of this got filmed. His, his children, grandchildren, wife didn't see him land. So he's not happy, so he's there, grumpy, he's collecting his chute, and he sees this dot in the distance coming closer and closer. It's obviously a person. Person gets up upon him, looks like he's a farmer dressed in overalls, et cetera. And they exchange some pleasantries, and um, the, the uh, skydiver says to the um, uh, farmer, well, where am I? You know, he says, where am I? And the farmer says, well, you're in my tobacco field. And the skydiver, again, not in a good mood, he, he snaps back at the farmer, you must be an economist. And the, the farmer kind of looks surprised, and he says, well, I, I guess you could call me an economist. I went to NC State, got a degree in agricultural economics. You really need to know about markets and prices and world trade to be a successful farmer. Uh, how did you know I was an economist? And the skydiver says, because you told me something absolutely true, but of no use to me whatsoever. <laughs> so I always like to present that joke to lower your expectations of what I, uh, representing the economics profession, can deliver. Uh, my topic today is technological unemployment. Uh, the slide says the issue of the century question mark for me, that take the question mark off. I do think that is going to be the issue of the uh, century. The way this got started in terms of my work is I, I did a book a couple of years ago on the North Carolina economy. North Carolina, like the governor mentioned most, or, or Diane mentioned also, most southern states have gone through a lot of change in the last several decades, and a book I wrote in 2007 uh, documented how North Carolina's particular economy has cha changed from the tobacco, textiles, furniture economy to what it is today. Um, let that book simmer and time for a new book, and the new book is looking at what North Carolina is gonna look like in 2050. And uh, in the course of that, I looked at obviously a number of issues, uh, what industries will be leading in North Carolina, what, what, um, uh, where will we live, how many people we have, uh, resource use, energy use, et cetera. Obviously a very key part of that though is looking at jobs. And as I dug into that work, I came across some research, uh, Ted mentioned actually by two British economists, who uh, were looking at what they projected would be potential likely outcomes of all this technological change that we're going through. And uh, they wrote a, a journal article that, that uh, in fact, at the time it was published, got a lot of headlines that said something to the effect that in um, 2050, half the jobs uh, that we have today won't exist. And that caught my attention. So I communicated with them, uh, dug into what they did, replicated their work specifically for North Carolina, and really came to some sobering conclusions that we may be looking at a total transformation of our job market, which has all kind of implications for what people will do if they will do anything, what kind of training they will have, et cetera. So that's where this stems. So, so what I'm gonna share with you uh, in my minutes is to, is to walk through some of my uh, thought process about that. Um, you can see technological unemployment. Again, technological unemployment simply means technology replacing human inputs in the delivery of uh, products and services. Uh, recently, it was announced that there, was a, uh, there is a, a hotel in, in uh, Japan where you check in, you don't, you're not greeted by a, uh, a human being like we were here, but you're greeted by robots. That's an actual picture of those, uh, those robotic greeters in a Japanese hotel. Uh, driverless vehicles, you've heard obviously about driverless vehicles. Think about if we, if we get to that point, what that could do to the transportation industry and what that could do to the number of jobs, number of truck drivers, et cetera, that we have out on the roads. 3D manufacturing. Uh, again, you've probably heard about this. This is um, a process whereby you can, you can manufacture customized products uh, in your home that fit specifically for what you want. This came home to me recently in that my wife has uh, prodded me to uh, at least finance a, uh, a kitchen remodel. And uh, one of the things we've actually had trouble with is finding a refrigerator to fit the space where the old refrigerator is. And I'm thinking if we had 3D manufacturing, we could customize the exact refrigerator we wanted for that space. There are many futures to say that's around the corner and that may eliminate factories and factory workers because you just, you need a new TV, you make it yourself. Uh, in fact, someone has already uh, 3D manufactured a vehicle. 
So um, uh, these are all examples of technology, uh, recent examples of technology replacing human labor. A lot of benefits to this. Um, uh, you don't need to pay, give, give pay raises to robots and other technology. Uh, they don't take vacation. Uh, they can be precisely tuned to do exactly what you, what you want. And some argue that this could actually, if we, if we saw, uh, we call, saw the kind of deployment of uh, robotics and other kinds of technological advancements in the workforce, uh, this would actually help the country's trade balance because we wouldn't need to, or companies wouldn't be motivated to go to countries, often offshore, uh, in order to take advantage of low-cost labor, because labor is not going to be as relevant in this world. Um, so uh, this is not a new issue. Those of you who remember your high school history may have remembered a, uh, a group of people in the um, uh, 1700s in England called Luddites. In fact, this term is often thrown up as uh, someone will say, well, that person's a Luddite. What Luddites were were folks in, um, in uh, uh, England when, uh, who uh, developed at a time when um, um, you, you were just beginning to get um, uh, machinery coming into the apparel factories and looms, for example. And so people were being displaced. Their jobs were being displaced by this, by this uh, for that time, advanced technology. And there were, there were uh, people who, I think the, the gentleman who organized this was named uh, Ludd. Uh, there were groups who went around at night and broke into factories, uh, apparel factories, and destroyed the looms. That's a little picture of them. So uh, the, the issue of people's work and jobs being displaced by machinery and technology is, is not new. We had a, a massive example of this uh, in the US at the turn of the century from the uh, 19th to 20th century. Uh, in my state, I'll use obviously a lot of examples from North Carolina. In my state, North Carolina, in uh, 100 years ago, 50% of the workforce worked on farms. 50% of workers worked on the farm 100 years ago. Today in North Carolina, it's one and a half percent. And yet in North Carolina, we produce five times more agricultural products, uh, livestock and crops than we did 100 years ago. And that's all due to what started with the tractor. And obviously today, if you go to a modern farm, North Carolina, Kentucky, Missouri, uh, farmers are very, very technological adept um, I'm not, this is not my area of expertise, but friends of mine tell me that um, farmers now have instrumentation that will allow them to look at microclimates in their fields and knowing exactly how much water to be put over here in this part of the field versus that part of the field. Amazing. And then if you look at uh, um, John Maynard Keynes, who, uh, among other things, we could say he was the father of stimulus programs, uh, but a very, very uh, well-known economist, probably the most uh, dominant, influential economist of the 20th century, he actually predicted this. He, he argued that uh, way back in the 1930s, in fact, he coined the term technological unemployment, uh, that eventually technology will keep encroaching upon human work and uh, he forecast in, uh, in the 1930s that eventually the average work week would be under 30 hours a week. And uh, he was asked, well, what are people going to do? Well, he thought that people would use this time, this free time, to study the classics, uh, to um, 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 uh, become enlightened about various subjects, et cetera. Probably not his best prediction on that. But anyway, my point here is that this is not a new phenomenon, it's really a continuation of, uh, of what we've seen in the past. Uh, but, um, oh, uh, one, other, one other aspect of this, let me make sure I didn't miss a slide, no, I did not miss a slide. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, uh, obviously, uh, for, for very important reasons, about the decline of the middle class. And I'm not going to get into how you define the middle class. But uh, I think all of us know, in general, however we define it, that the number of people in those middle income levels, number of households, or at least the percentage of households in those middle income levels has, have been going down. Uh, economists who've really born into this and studied this argue that really technological unemployment is, is probably one of the major causes of that. So there's obviously societal issues related to this. Um, now, uh, if you look at where technological unemployment has, at least to date, most had an impact. It's in what we call the middle skill level of jobs. This is just a chart that takes a, um, a schematic 
from a, um, um, a MIT economist named David Autor, A-U-T-O-R, probably the leading economist who studies, who has been studying the impact of technology on the labor market. And what Autor has done is he has taken occupations and divided them into three groups. Um, the analytical cognitive group, which would be on your left, uh, are generally higher paying jobs that require higher levels of education. Uh, they are jobs where you need a lot of thought processes going on. There's a lot of very crucial decision making going on. Good example of that would be a, a surgeon uh, who is obviously extensively trained and as he gets in, I've had a couple of uh, surgeries uh, and I'm glad I had good surgeons because uh, in both cases the surgeon afterward told me, you know when we got in there, we didn't find what we thought we could find. We, we had to really uh, think about this to, to patch you up, which they fortunately did. Uh, at least I think they did. Um, so anyway, those, those jobs have actually been increasing, if you look at the slide, in terms of percentage of the workforce. Uh, and let me go to the far right side, your far right side. Uh, Non-routine manual jobs. Now these are also jobs that require um, uh, uh, on-the-spot decision-making, uh, just like the cognitive analytical jobs do, but the, the difference is their jobs, the kind of decision-making that's being done is not perhaps of a, uh, a, a, a as important of a level. Uh, example might be a, a security guard. Not, again, not to take anything away from those, those jobs, security guards, but security guards have to respond to situations. They hear a noise over here, they see a light over there, they go investigate. The middle jobs uh, are um, author calls routine um, cognitive slash manual jobs. These are jobs where you're doing the same thing over and over and over. Think of that famous episode on I Love Lucy where Ethel and Lucy are on the, what is it, the candy, they're on a, in a candy factory and they've got pieces of candy going by and somehow they get, they're supposed to put the candy in a box and they get behind so they start stuffing the pieces of candy in their mouth, et cetera. Uh, so an assembly line, think of an assembly line, although that's not the only example. This is where we've really seen to date the impacts of technological unemployment because those kind of jobs are absolutely ripe for machines, robots, other kinds of technology to come in and, uh, and uh, replace people. Um, the, the modern auto factory, North Carolina for example, my state of North Carolina has gone after a couple times, well actually more than a couple times, uh, auto manufacturing plants. We've yet to, to bag one. Uh, Governor, you have gotten some. If you don't like them, send them over to us. Um, but um, uh, if you look at the structure, however, of a modern uh, auto manufacturing plant, not to in any way diminish the importance of having one of those in a, in a state, the capital labor to labor ratio, which is just an economist uh, quick metric of how much non-labor input you have compared to labor inputs has clearly shifted away from people into machinery and technology. In fact, there are some who say that the future auto plant, in fact, there's a cartoon. I, I keep forgetting to put this into my slides. There's a cartoon I came across one time that showed the uh, auto manufacturing, it was a schematic of the auto manufacturing plant of the future. And what you saw in the cartoon was in the background, all of these robots on the assembly line, assembling the vehicle. In the foreground, you saw one person and a dog. And the caption was, the dog is there to make sure the person doesn't bother the robots. So um, that's even changing. Um, and, and so the point here is that we are, are thinking that with further changes and improvements and advancements in technology, things like artificial intelligence, virtualization, nanotechnology, the internet of everything, 3D manufacturing, that we are simply, we are just on the cusp today of, 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 of new movement in technology going into areas that it's never gone into before, going into some of those cognitive jobs, going into some of those, um, those service level jobs and taking those away. So the question uh, might be phrased, in fact, I came across this quote recently, the question is not whether, uh, the, the question is not what will technology do next, the question is what, will te what technology won't be able to do next. Uh, that's how one futurist really framed this, that we are getting so good and so better and so advanced in technology, it's gonna, that technology is going to be able to do things and do, do jobs that humans are doing now that we never even thought possible before. Um, so, to get back to my um, 
research, um, I took the uh, British economists whose name are Fry and Osborne, I took their model, which was a very extensive model of looking at over 700 classifications of occupations and uh, trying to ascertain what's the likelihood that, the, that that occupation would cease to exist in the future because that, that activity could be taken by, uh, by technology. Uh, so they went through this, and I, what I did is took their methodology and applied it again to my state of, of North Carolina. I think Ted's going to share, share with you some results of applying this to other states. And I don't expect you to read all of those numbers on there. I, I, did, I do remember my, my uh, lessons of how to do PowerPoint slides. But the reason I put that up is to give you a sense of how extensive this may be. This is a chart. This is for North Carolina. This is a chart that is showing you just those occupations in North Carolina that have more than 10,000 people in them now. So it's not all occupations. And that Fry and Osborne said would have greater than a 70% chance of not existing in the future because they'd be taken over by, uh, by technology. And just to give you some examples here, again, I know you can't read these, uh, things like uh, bartenders, dishwashers, security guards, uh, sales personnel, executive secretaries, uh, school bus drivers, retail salespersons, uh, bill collectors, receptionists, cashiers, uh, bookkeeping clerks, shipping and receiving clerks, tellers, uh, loan officers. Quite, quite extensive. Quite, quite extensive. So this is what we may be looking at. Now, I, I emphasize May. The work that Fry and Osborne did had a great level of subjectivity to it. Uh, they had to make an assessment they, as well as consulting with other experts in the field, they had to make, a, make an assessment about what the likelihood was that technology could be developed in a way that could actually do that particular activity. Um, if you uh, look at the bigger picture on this, um, and, and no offense to our to the Department of Labor, our U.S. Department of Labor, uh, but the U.S. Department of Labor puts out forecasts of occupational change. And so uh, what I did was I said, let's look at what their latest forecasts are suggesting in terms of these broad classifications, the auteur classifications of jobs, that is the, the cognitive jobs, the, uh, the uh, non-routine manual jobs, et cetera. Let's look at what the Department of Labor is forecasting in terms of change in those jobs over the next um, uh, almost uh, 20, uh, 30 plus years, and then contrast that to uh, the kind of forecast you would get if you would apply the Fry Osborne technology. And as you can see, hopefully, um, uh, big, big differences. Uh, for example, the only um, category of work uh, in which we would expect an increase in the number of jobs, whether you use Department of Labor or Fry Osborne, is in those analytical management jobs, the highest level of jobs, those requiring the highest level of education. Uh, although um, the numbers are quite different, uh, Department of Labor, now this is, again, this is for North Carolina only, Department of Labor would expect by 2050 there to be a million more of those jobs in North Carolina, Fry Osborne, uh, only 288,000. But on the other two categories, those routine jobs and then the, the I'll call them service jobs, um, Department of Labor says yes, we will see increases, uh, Fry Osborne says no, we will see decreases. So again, this is rather sobering. This is rather sobering uh, that there is the potential there for there to be a dramatic overhaul of jobs in uh, the coming future. If this happens, one big question is what's, what's going to happen to the folks who, who don't have the right skills to get a job? Will this create a permanent underclass? In fact, if you look at that third word down, precariates, this is a, a term that was, has already been coined by a sociologist who's been looking at this same phenomenon. And he's arguing, uh, he, he's coined this term to, to signify people who will be losing their jobs in the future due to technology, precariates. And the question from a policy point of view is, uh, will this mean that those folks will require permanent support, financial support? Might we need to create make work jobs, that is jobs that the private sector wouldn't necessarily create in order to give those folks something useful to do? And what will be the impacts on expanding inequality? So again, I don't mean to be um, a, a dour person here and I don't mean to, to paint a bleak picture, but 
I do think that we are in the midst of something that could have some of these, uh, the, some of these effects, and I think it's better to be warned than to be surprised. Um, there, is a, there is a potential answer here, and the, the answer is, and many of my colleagues, uh, this would be the answer they would give. They would say, look, Walden, what you're talking about has happened before. Again, the farm to factory change. Uh, we always have had technological change. We've always had technological unemployment. Uh, we have always been able to create different kinds of jobs. So there are many economists who argue this is not new. Uh, yes, it may be happening into, in a different array of jobs, but the economy will solve the problem. And, and the reason for why that answer is given is that uh, there will still be people making money, uh, earning profits, presumably off of the new technology, off of the robots, et cetera. So someone in the economy is going to be earning money and they will spend that money and by that nature they will be creating other kinds of jobs. And the argument is this has always happened in history and will happen in the past. So it doesn't mean that we want to ignore it, but it suggests that there's not going to be a permanent underclass of, peop underclass of people who don't have jobs being created. Um, where might these new jobs uh, be developed, uh, you say? Well, uh, again, economists are not very good at predicting micro answers like this, but if you look at the literature and you look at some of the trends, here's a list of at least some. Uh, household management, by that I mean that um, uh, people who are particularly a household where if you, you're two spouses or, or two partners, both working, both working at well-paying jobs, they don't have time to do the day-to-day -day household chores, the shopping, the the, the uh, 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 daycare, et cetera, uh, might we see an expansion, already we've seen some, might we see an expansion of jobs of folks helping assist those types of households through their, their daily life? And I put that under the broad category of household management. Uh, likewise, organizational management, same sort of, of, of uh, idea, except that, and this has been very interesting, I read an entire book about this, by organizational management, I argue, or at least the author of the books that I read argues that one of the things that, that uh, folks who are looking ahead at what machines and technology might be able to do, uh, one of the things that I identify, they identify that machines maybe won't be able to do, at least in the near term, is interpersonal relations. Uh, one of the reasons why people, city, I think most of you know in your states, if you look at where growth is occurring, there, it's occurring in the urban areas. In my state of North Carolina, Charlotte and Raleigh are clearly the, the fastest growing areas. We have about 30 counties of, out of 100 are actually depopulated. So people are going to cities. And you might say, well, why are people moving to the cities if, if we have all this technology? You can FaceTime, you can text, et cetera. What, what, what do you get by being face-to-face -face with people? Aha, this is where many say there's no substitute for that face-to-face -face contact. If you're in a business deal, um, you not only want to communicate with your, your rival or your partner, but you want to see their facial expressions. You want to look at their body language, that that's all very, very important, reading people. And uh, technology, some say, will not be able to do that. And so I put those kind of jobs under organizational management. And incidentally, the folks who are promoting that as a, as a growth area in terms of employment say, that's where your humanities education may be most, most valuable, because there's a lot of concern that we're, are we getting away, are, man, are humanities jobs thrown, being thrown aside? And uh, this would argue that perhaps that's where you want uh, people who are skilled in the humanities. Repair and maintenance of technology. Obviously, if we're gonna have more technology, you need to be repaired and maintained. Global interaction. This is along the lines of the, the world becoming closer economically, so there's going to be more trade, more interaction with people of other cultures. I tell my undergraduates now, don't take that language requirement lightly. Uh, one, of my, one of my regrets in my undergraduate education is I didn't learn a language fluently. My wife did. Uh, uh, and and uh, I think for me now it's a matter of opening up a whole new culture, but in terms of being able to interact with people from other countries, other cultures, knowing the language, knowing the nuances of the language, very, very important. Um, data management analysis, that's going to be big. Um, we're, we're, we're getting so much data, uh, and that's going to help us run things more efficiently, but you have to, you have to be able to analyze it. Uh, in my state, SAS. 
uh, which is a company that developed from a professor in statistics who um, uh, took his ideas and formed his own now multi-billion dollar company. A couple decades ago, there was a question about whether NC State had any claim to those profits. Um, I think that's been solved, though, in part because that gentleman has endowed some buildings at NC State. But anyway, um, uh, that's going to be a growth area. Aged-assisted, we're, we're aging population, um, as we're living longer, people living longer, they need, they need help. I'm 65, I know I need help, maybe more occupations there. Uh, education and retraining, which I'm going to get to in a moment. And uh, very interestingly, some say that there's going to be a rebellion. There's going to be a rebellion uh, by some, not by all, of uh, people who know that when they buy something, it's not customized, it's, it's out of a factory, it's, it's one of many. Uh, yes, it's the lowest price thing, but there are going to be some households who say, you know, I want to go back to that old style craftsmanship. I want to, if I buy a, a table, dining room table, I want to know the person who actually makes that table and make it to my specifications. Now, obviously, not everyone can afford that, but there are some who argue that artisanship is going to come back in many, many areas. So just some thoughts here where jobs might, some growth areas for, for occupations and job category. Now, I think what all, one of, the, one of the clear implications in my mind of what all this means is we're going to have to rethink education. Uh, broadly. We're going to have to rethink what the role of pre-K to K is. We're going to have to rethink the role of colleges. Vocational training, I think, is going to have, need to be looked at again. Um, the role of, of technology in education, and by that I mean not understanding necessarily about technology, but using technology to help people adapt. Uh, facilitating reskilling. I think if this technological unemployment as, as technological unemployment uh, unfolds, if it does, what that means is that workers of the future, uh, unlike a worker today, who, or in the recent past, who may have had two or three jobs in his or her lifetime doing the same thing, but two or three uh, different employers, in the future, that person may have two or three different occupations. May, they may be trained for an occupation, then it gets taken over by technological unemployment or eliminated by technological unemployment, they've got to go back and retra be retrained. So I think we need to think about how to facilitate that, what I expect to be constant stream, increased stream of folks coming back to uh, educational facilities because they have to, be, uh, have to be retrained. And of course, in all this, we, we want to try to bend the cost curve in education and make these changes delivered in this education, this retraining uh, delivered in a more cost-effective way. Um, I do think another policy implication is that we want to rethink how we help folks who are unemployed. The traditional model is, my father, for example, late father, uh, worked all his life as a carpenter. And uh, that's, a, that's an occupation, the construction industry, where he would go, period he would go through periodic situations of, of unemployment uh, due to the weather. Uh, primarily, so we was off work for a couple weeks, then go back. Uh, the, the, the unemployment compensation system that we largely use fit my father because it wasn't that his job was going away, it was simply that there were periods of time where the weather prevented him from working, and so he would draw unemployment compensation, and when the weather cleared up, he'd go back to work. But for the kind of worker that I'm talking about now who may become unemployed, what I would call structurally unemployed because that occupation of that worker was doing is gone, uh, the, that kind of unemployment compensation system doesn't work. And so what we might think about is two different kinds of unemployment compensation systems. One that fits the kind of occupation like my father had, but another that fits the kind of occupations that people have where the occupation may be just totally eliminated. And so there what we might want to think about is something like a retraining voucher. Not pay that person while they are unemployed, but give them a lump sum amount that they can use to go back to the community college, to go back to the four-year college and get reskilled in something else. Um, another thing, public policy implication that I think we ought to think about is, and I, I mean, I tried to think of something cutesy here, and I don't know if I succeeded, is um, implementing what I cutely call a EWOC system, E-W-O-C. Uh, standing for early warning of occupational change. I don't you know that you, you, you have to judge whether you, that flies or not. But the, the point is that uh, we do get, obviously, mo all states have access to, to job data. 
uh, in North Carolina, and I'm sure all states, uh, we, every year we have access to um, a profile of employment actually by 700, 700 different occupational categories. So year to year we can see where the employment categories that are, that are declining, the employment categories that are increasing. What I would like to see is, or what I'm, I'm recommending that we think about is, is might we accelerate that a little bit more? Maybe what we need, and this is outside my realm of expertise, I'm not a statistician, uh, but maybe what we need is to employ some uh, sampling system of, of companies in a state so that we're getting, the, the, the state government's getting real time information on occupations where hiring is increasing, occupations where hiring is declining, so that we get a picture of how the occupational structure is changing on a much more rapid basis. So that we can use that information to take that to the community colleges and take that to the four year colleges and say, Here, here's what looks like it's happening in terms of trends and occupations. Here are, the ones, here are the ones that seem to be increasing. Here are the new ones that we never even knew existed. Here are the ones that seem to be going by the wayside. So I think our intelligence, our data intelligence on tracking occupational change, if we can, if we can upgrade that and make it uh, more readily accessible and more uh, current, uh, that would be uh, very much uh, uh, benefited. All right, and wrapping up, um, the future is always going to be unpredictable. Um, when I started in this occupation as a professional economist at a, a public university, uh, coming out of graduate school, uh, I was full of myself, thought that, yeah, I can predict the next recession. I can tell you exactly what industries are going to grow. I can tell you what occupations are, are going to occur and what people are going to make. The longer I do this, and I'm now in my fourth decade, uh, the less that I think I can do in that regard. Um, so don't look on me, and I'll let my colleagues talk for themselves, but don't look on me as, as someone who can tell you exactly what's going to happen. I think the future, by definition, is unpredictable. Uh, it's challenging. Uh, but I think it will also be exciting. And what I think, however, uh, what I think it's important to recognize is that half the battle is knowing what might be ahead. Um, so if we can know what might be ahead, and I do emphasize might, then we can perhaps plan for it. So if we think that uh, massive technological unemployment is ahead, and all the signs are pointing to that. And if we monitor that through this EWOC system that I'm recommending, that we can track that, then, then we can make better plans. Uh, I do think this is the, uh, the issue of the, of the century. Uh, and I do think it's pro largely unrecognized right now. And I think it's going to have massive, massive impacts on our workforce, on our standards of living. So I do think it's worthy of dramatic attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. For, uh, for those of you, I want you to think about this. The, the research that was done was done on 702 occupations. And they deconstructed every one of those occupations based on what machines can do and are emerging to do and what they can't do. And just, just so you know, they, they think machines aren't very good at social intelligence, not very good at creativity, not very good at perception and manipulation. But they know that they're getting better and better at learning. They're better at data mining themselves. They manipulate big data as they go with sensors. Machine vision has made huge leaps. Machines can see now and react. They can use computational uh, statistics to move things around. And, and they're emerging with artificial intelligence. And some of you probably, you know, Watson and what he did in Jeopardy, you see that. And so they took all of these apart Every single occupation, they said, well, over the next 20 years, this is not possible. And there's a, it's a long list of, of, Mike talked about the ones that were at the top, you know, really susceptible. There's a long list at the bottom. You know, recreational therapist, almost no chance for a machine. Uh, oral surgeons, choreographers, uh, elementary school teachers, speech pathologists, curators, anthropologists, no, no chance. They look like their numbers. And among fast-growing occupation, nurses are up there. You know, not, not really going to be impacted. But at the other end, we started taking a look, and it's something SGA is going to be uh, producing over the next few months, at every state's top 10 
occupational category and started looking at their fastest growing. And we looked at the top 10 and just for instance in Georgia, the top 10 occupational categories are retail salesperson, uh, freight laborers, cashiers, food prep, customer service, office clerks, general operational managers, waiters and waitresses, registered nurses, and secretaries and admin. That's the top 10. Just to give you some idea of what we're talking about, the impact on Georgia over the next 20 years could be close to 700,000 jobs just in those 10 occupations. And we start looking at the South, looked at the American South numbers, the numbers of jobs potentially lost in the top 10 occupations only are about the same number of jobs the U.S. lost in the Great Recession, almost 9 million. And when we start running those numbers, they scare the crap out of us, frankly. I mean, if you're sitting around looking at, you know, what does 1 or 2 percent unemployment do to a state, that kind of shift, what does it mean? Now, I'm also not a Luddite. I, 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 gotta, I love every tech gadget on the planet, and I believe we'll create new jobs from that. But the thing I'm sure of is the people who just lost their jobs won't be skilled for those new ones. And so the impacts might not be that we have a whole bunch more unemployed people, but they certainly might be that we have to retrain half the workforce. And so we put together a panel today to try to have a, have a conversation about this. We're going to talk to them, but then I'm going to talk to y'all too. And warning for all the policy people in the front row, we're going to talk to y'all really soon. So just, you know. Uh, but the whole room, because if we're not looking ahead, and making policy decisions, then as the Southern Governors Association, we're not doing what we're here to do, which is try to help y'all see what, what the issues are in the future. Because we all know that we, the world changes faster than we can react. And that's basically what we're trying to get to. So we, we wanted today to spend a little time trying to dig into this subject and then let y'all talk about it as we went through the rest of the program over the next day. So we've got, we've got a group of Big thinkers up on the stage. <laughs> and uh, well, Eric That's the best thing I've been called in a long time. <laughs> yeah, <Eric's laughs> big thinker today, sorry. I, you know, if you don't like big thinking today, then you know, it's okay. I'm going to introduce all of them, and then I'm just going to ask you, just, the first question is, what's your initial reaction? So, so uh, just going through, Eric Selesna is the Deputy Assistant Director for the Employment and Training Administration for the Department of Labor. You've been doing this most of your life. And, been studying, you've looked at deployment and training issues from the local level, state level, and now national, and how we get people to work. When I talk to people all the time, we always, people have seen me do, I always ask people to grade the economy, and they grade it. And that when I ask what you grade it on, it's jobs. It's do people have jobs? Can they feed their families? Can they do this? It's jobs. So Eric's going to help us see from the perspective nationally of how can we react to these types of things. Chris Massengale is the federal co-chair for the Delta Regional Authority. So eight state, 252 county and parish region, uh, quite frankly, in a really hard area of the country to generate jobs in these days. Chris has been really effective with that. I think 42,000 jobs over the course of your time there and another 12,000 people trained for new jobs and leveraged a billion dollars. But we don't go many places in the Delta that don't need help these days. Still there. Chuck Florey, probably on rural America, now I, I don't, you know, you're not on each other a long time. I get asked rural questions more than anything, and if Chuck doesn't know the answer to them, then I tell all my clients, I don't know. True that. Rupri is the preeminent think tank in the country out of the University of Iowa. Chuck is the, let's see, what? Founder, Chair Emeritus, I'm president. president. They forced me right? back. And, and now policy <laughs> super dude, right? If you, if you want to know policy issues on rural America, then you talk to Chuck. De Deborah's just trying to solve all the problems of the world in workforce, <laughs> I think, these days. Uh, man, your title is Vice President for Community Economic Development, mm -hmm. but ACT is doing work ready communities now in 23? 24. 24, <laughs> new since we printed the program. 24 <laughs> states around the country. How do you find this problem? Everywhere you go, we all say, we got businesses that can't find people, we got people who can't find work, how do we quantify what they know, how do we find out what's needed, and, and ACT is spending their time trying to figure that out, and helping communities at the community level mm -hmm. make sure their employees and their citizens are there. 
So these, all day long, that's what they do all day, is try to figure out these issues. So I, I'm not going to call on you individually, but reactions? What, what do you think? Is, techno, is it the, an issue that we should be thinking about, worried about, or are we overreacting? Eric? Um, what am I pushing here? Um, can, is this on? I think so. Okay, great. Um, sure, it's always good to think about these things. I wouldn't worry about them yet. Um, and certainly if I was making state policy decisions, I wouldn't worry about them, but it's certainly worth thinking. And as I told Michael when he sat down over here, this data made my head hurt um, a little bit. And I certainly wouldn't forecast all of my uh, future on Department of Labor BLS data. Uh, if you were to look at the data from 30 years ago, I wonder how accurate it would be today, right? And there'll be jobs and occupations that come up two weeks from now that we hadn't even thought about, right? We don't have video store clerks anymore. Those who were climbing telephone poles to string telephone wires then went into cell towers, and now uh, there's a booming industry in installing um, wireless dishes because the wireless load is so incredibly high. So those things will change with time. You know, who was thinking about fracking, you know, 20 years ago and some of the jobs that have created out of that. So there will always be economic and technology changes that influence that. I'm a little bit um, hopeful that, as you said, you know, this will create other jobs, and I think that was part and parcel of what, what Michael was saying. But I do think it's important to think about that. And the Department of Labor's there's a very high level group working on a report about the future of work. And so a lot of it is about, you know, what is the effects on, on people during this too, right? Worker protections, benefits, the gig economy, are people just gonna be ultimately contractors or will they be employees working for somebody else? Um, and I think this also has tremendous impacts for lower wage and lower skill folks across the country, which is why the, the, the need for credentials uh, and training is just crucial in this day. As many of the states in the room today and the governors have been such leaders on that. And by the way, I bring um, greetings from Secretary Perez, who sends his best, knew I was coming out here, spent a lot of time in the states here. So, I, you know, I think there's, there's uh, a lot of opportunity. I think the largest point here is when you're talking about workforce policy or education and training, skills policy, whatever it is, is, you know, uh, the workforce and skills training follows demand. And so it's really important that we're in touch with demand. We're in touch with the business community, not one large business, but 10 or 20 or 30 manufacturers, 10 or 20 hospitals, 30 or 40 hotels, and to find out what their workforce needs are for now and in the short-term future. And so we can really craft our public workforce programs so they're meeting the need of employers now. So that will change over time, obviously. But, you know, um, the president has called this job-driven training, and we spent a lot of time on it. I'll talk more about it later today. Um, but those sort of job-driven training strategies will keep us engaged, a little bit more real-time training and preparation for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Mike, by the way, we, you, you and I neither one said it, but the report also said that the, there would be a higher disproportional impact on lower wage or lower skilled jobs. More of those are in the, the impact from computerization. So, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for the Assistant Secretary's point, in, I think it's right on. In, in fact, I saw someone forwarded me a, a video of, from Stephen Hawking now. Yeah who uh, argued that technology and technological change is actually widening income inequality, which is one of the things that I said. That was this week, if you yeah. want to say that. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, jump in. I'd be happy to jump in. First, I, I would like to just acknowledge the leadership in the room. I really admire the Southern Governors Association, and I've watched this for years as you come together as leaders, and thank you, Governor Brashear, for your leadership here. Um, I think it's so important as a region you come together while you may compete as states, you come together as a region to solve those really big issues. So I, I re just really wanted to acknowledge that um, and just thank you all for your leadership. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack here, and I, I put a few notes together because I had the opportunity to read this ahead of time. Um, you know, innovation and technology advancements are going to happen, and, and I think that was very clear. And I really like the closing slide, you can't control, but you can make plans. And I think that's why everyone is here today, um, just embracing and preparing for change. I think the thing to be cognizant of, my big takeaway, is the pace of change is going to accelerate, and it will be exponential. The change that maybe we saw in the Industrial Revolution and our opportunity to respond to that will not be the same as the pace of change with the technology, uh, the increasing in technology and its impact will be much faster. And I think that's going to put added pressure on the adaption to the change. Um, ACT, we work with a lot of southern states, and we have a long history of that, and we're very proud of that. 
Those of you that know us well know we are a mission-driven company. We are here to help people achieve education and workplace success. We're committed to providing a wider range of solutions across a wider span of life decision points in an increasingly individualized way so we can benefit all. And I say that because we're specifically currently right now upping our game and we're upping it in the area of skills. And I think that relates directly to the comments that were made here today. It's looking and identify what skills are gonna matter for employers today and tomorrow. And then being able to identify what those skills are and understanding how to measure and then sharing that information with individuals so they can better be prepared for them. One of the most recent things that we have been working with and looking at is working with 27 industry associations in partnership with the National Network of Business and Industry Associations. And what they have come together and they have identified four key areas of skills. Those are personal skills like integrity. Those are people skills like teamwork. Applied technology such as in applied math and workplace skills which are decision making those skills are gonna become increasingly more important. That was my big takeaway. It's exactly what we were hearing with this analysis and decision-making jobs not going away. Our ability to be able to take the skills that are needed and find ways of integrating them into our K-12 systems and into younger ages and developing and preparing that future workforce now is critically important. And that is one of the things that we, are not one, it is the thing we are working on at ACT and helping people be better prepared. And quite frankly, working with the policy leaders in this room on helping to make sure people in your states are better prepared. Deborah, I think this actually might be a, a good place for me to kind of piggyback on some of the groundwork that you laid. Uh, Dr. Walder, and I was getting a chance too to kind of look at the slides and take a look at some of the information for for me and and my perspective with the Delta Regional Authority it's a little hard and governor I think you can appreciate this we're so in the trenches right we're we're in the weeds we're trying to address these immediate needs and I think about some of your comments about the future and technology and we will have change and transition with technology and the impact of jobs but you made a point, Ted, that, that really uh, rang true with me, and is that I would submit to you that even many of those jobs in the top 10 that you said that would be impacted, we have a growing workforce that, that does not have the skill set to meet those jobs now, right? In my footprint, in the eight states, excluding Missouri and Illinois, I've got over 2 million jobs unfilled right now in my states. And so we're trying to figure out how do we link the current system, how do we take great leadership like Governor Bashiris has shown with reconstituting the, the state's uh, innovation board as it relates to workforce, how do we continue to drive a certified work-ready communities in our footprint, which is some of the partnerships that we're working with, how do we try to <laughs> leverage some of those local skill sets and assets like we do when it comes to the culture and geotourism pieces so we can utilize what we see for long-term pieces, long-term employability. You know, Deborah, you, you mentioned those, those five skill sets. Those now are becoming more and more a part of that conversation as it relates to employability skills. And so regardless of what happens with the transition, with the impact of technology, that base skill set in the system, and Ted, we've been working on this particular piece as a result of a lot of good work that Southern Governors initiated several years ago with reimagining the Delta workforce, where we know we've got a workforce system that in a lot of places is very disconnected, uh, and we've seen lots of movement to correct that. Uh, Kentucky has led the way with your certified work ready program. Missouri is one of the first in the country to do ACT's piece of it, so we're seeing that change. So I think the big piece for me is that while we are so much in the weeds when we're trying to just feel the gap you mentioned. Truckers was on your list, Dr. Walden. And it's interesting trying to balance that, recognizing that there's gonna be a change in that specific uh, field or industry. But when you've got companies like J.B. Hunt, Maverick Trucking that's in my footprint, those starting wages are somewhere between 50 and $80,000. They've got 25,000 uh, shortage slots right now that they would like to fill. Those are good jobs in our part of the country, in rural America. Those are really life-changing good jobs 
that are going to be around a while. So for me, it's trying to balance all that while trying to tackle the immediate need of connecting the opportunity. Uh, and I just want to say I agree totally with Chris's comments, and um, I, I think every region is going to be different. What happens in the Delta is going to be different job-wise than what's happening in my area of the Research Triangle in, in North Carolina, and I think that's why uh, it does behoove us to try to make sure we're collecting real time as much as possible local data so that we can say, oh yes, the demand for truck drivers is going up in, in the Delta region. Yeah, there are these features to say in 50 years maybe we won't have truck drivers, but that's 50 years ago, 50 years away. We, we need them now. I, I totally agree with that and I, I would, you, would, you would certainly want to address that. So I think that's why we need to have um, localized information. Uh, the, the, these changes, these technological changes are not going to uh, occur at the same rate uh, and speed in every locality. First of all, I want to uh, thank SGA for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, a lot of folks on this panel I really respect and Ted tremendously. I commend the association also for taking this on. I want to take a little different tack. I don't believe this is a workforce problem. I believe this is a species challenge for human nature and the human race and I think we are in a global challenge because controlled economies and totalitarian economies solve their workforce challenge by shooting the people that don't like what's going on. In uh, an advanced, developed economy, we have a deeper challenge. Uh, it's really not about workforce. It's about innovation, creativity, and technology. And it's always going to be developed. Whatever we have, we always develop. But I want to take a little different track. There's a lot of discussion in this campaign about income inequality, distribution of wealth, social mobility. This question is a wicked problem that's central to every one of those issues and is policy malleable, I think. Uh, I'd ask a deeper question. It's not about the nature of work. It's about human nature. It's about human creativity and it's about human value. The issues that are going to matter are human value interactions. I would also say from a, from a rural standpoint, the things that you cannot unplug are the things that we create by the great gift God gave us in our natural environment. Our forests, our natural amenities, our water, our food, our energy, and our cultural amenities. Those are going to be increasingly critical, I think, in this. I'd make last, two last comments about the criticality of K-12 and higher education. A lot of numbers thrown out. I'll just give you one. I think the challenge here is a class issue and a race issue. And you do not need to say there's an underclass to say most of the issues where we will solve this is in our professional class, all of those. 90% of the kids going to a community college today in the United States have to have a remedial education. Why did we do away with vocational and technical agriculture and technology programs in junior high and grade school so that you can go out and drive a truck when you're done? And how do we begin to align in a way that regionally appropriate, what ACT does, advantages start to accrue in the regions of human interaction where technology doesn't hurt us. Those are the human interactions, those are the issues around culture and around stewardship of natural resources. I'll make one final point. I think where we test this is the 700 micropolitan cities of our nation, aligning them with eight or 10 counties around them in logical human echo sheds of rural and urban people. Human problem, not a technology problem. There's two solution tracks. A lot of people say we'll retrain them. The literature says people are going to learn to do different things. That raises a real question about what higher education truly is. When we were doing the humanities, it was to empower us to be better people. The, we then went to the utility of a higher education, and now every business is retraining their own people. What will it mean in higher ed now? Will we go back to human value interaction? What will we do with our free time? I personally think it isn't going away. I think it's driving at us, but I agree with all the, all the panelists here, and I commend SGA. In this region, the human issue is the critical one, and we've got to get at it. Thanks. So one of the things that uh, I started feeling a little better and then I started feeling a little worse when y'all were talking. Uh, <laughs> So I agree, you and I have had this a lot of times, none of us can predict the future. We can all follow trends, and 
it, it, I just check with the room here. How many people here think that there will be technological displacement of jobs in the coming years? Is there everybody? Anybody think that we're just chasing the wrong rabbit here? Okay. So now we're talking about degrees and what do we do about it? And none of this again is new. We've all said that. We've been, we've been on this train for a long time. I had four textile workers as grandparents who, you know, those those jobs aren't there anymore. They they moved and then they got eliminated. And to your truck driver, I mean, what truck driving companies? There's a reason that you know driverless trucks is a hot button. It's because you can't find people to drive trucks. So there's motivation here from a monetary standpoint. Economically, you try to drive this down. They don't need raises. They don't need vacations. But there's also the problem that we just can't find a lot of people to do some of these jobs. And they don't have the skills. And they're, you know, y'all have all heard this workforce. This is the workforce morass we get ourselves into. So this is an issue that I, I don't want to stop the world and, and spend all my time on this issue. But, I, but when we're talking about the, the Research says in the next 20 years we're talking about this. Well, 15 years ago was the, you know, the millennial bug. People in the room probably remember that. It didn't seem that long ago, right? So we're talking about pretty rapid technological shifts here. And as computerization, as, as uh, robotics and computerization accelerate, this could get faster. And I think that's what's beginning to scare some policy people. Governor, what do you think? Any, any questions? You can well, either talk about it or you can ask them, either way. Part of, you know, uh, let me turn this on. Yeah, they, we want to hear what you said. And there's no, a you don't. Camera at you too. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Good. In my eight years, I've seen this from A to Z. I came in at the end of 2007, in 2007, 8, and 9, my conversations with CEOs of companies went like this. Governor, I know you got a lot of people that need jobs, but we don't have any jobs. Today, my conversation is, Governor, we got 50 jobs available. We don't have anybody to fill them. They're not trained to fill them. I like the latter problem better, obviously. And it seems to me, I mean, you can look at this at a number of levels, but the level that most governors have to look at this uh, at is is the level of talking and partnership uh, partnering with the business community uh, the marketplace is going to define what these jobs are long term and if we form strong partnerships with the business community they're going to tell us what skills they need they're telling us right now we have formed uh, a strong partnership in most parts of the state. We're going to have it all filled out by in about another three or four months uh, in the manufacturing area. You know, today manufacturing is nothing like it was even five years ago or 10 years ago. But they are now telling us, you know, 20 and 30 companies in a region are coming together with our community colleges, technical schools, and they're saying, here's what we need. And they're designing the curricula for us so that we can train these people for what they need. Now, their needs will change. Another five years, it may be something else, or eight years, it may be something else. But if we have this continuous input and dialogue, we can hopefully keep up with, with what is needed out there. You know, you can look at this as, as a scary future, or you can look at this as a real opportunity. And, and I think... That's the way I look at it. I, you know, how much this is going to upgrade our, whole, our citizenry in terms of the skills they have to have. Obviously, there will be some people that never want it and, and won't do it. But the vast majority of people, you know, if encouraged in the right way and given the right kind of opportunity, are going to jump at all of these opportunities. They, we've got right now 9,000 displaced coal miners. Just happened in like 18 months yeah. to two years. And you talk about a change. I mean, boom. This wasn't five years. This was 18 months. And, you know, they were making eighty and $100,000 a year. And now they're unemployed. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing is trying to do that very thing, is to start matching up. They've got some great skills. But they have to be sort of redirected into new areas 
And unfortunately, right now, some of them are going to have to move because, you know, eastern Kentucky's economy isn't diversified to the point to where the jobs that they could fill if they were retrained are there. They're in Kentucky, but they're not there. So it's a, it's a long-term problem that we've got to resolve in eastern Kentucky. But in general, it seems to me that if we, that if we develop these strong ties to the marketplace, being the employers out there, they're going to know, or at least most of them, are going to know before we do what they need because they're looking down the road. If they're smart, they're planning ahead. They know what technology they hope is, in the, is coming along, how they're going to change um, all of their uh, processes. And, hey, I've got to have a person that's going to be able to do X, Y, or Z. So uh, to me, that's at least part of the solution. Governor, you're, we're going to come back to one of the issues. I just warned the panel that one of the things the governor talked about, it, this isn't geographically fair either. <laughs> These, these are very geographically disparate th impacts, and so we're going to come back to place-based stuff. Wanted to give uh, Chris or Andre any thoughts about what you've heard, or, or Jeff? Uh, well, I, I was really interested in, uh, in hearing kind of uh, about sort of the perspective on the humanities education and, and some of these things that you see. You know, we've done a lot, the Governor Nixon's done a lot with ACT and certified work-ready communities and identifying sort of the soft skills, kind of the other needs that, to the governor's point, that employers need. I'd just be interested in hearing more uh, about this, this notion of, uh, of how to train those kind of, you know, the, the humanities uh, uh, scholars of the next generation are actually the people that, that might actually be able to keep jobs in the face of this, this kind of uh, technological uh, advancement. Okay. Anybody want to touch on um, how important those types of skills are? Sure. Um, actually, I think that that's a wonderful point um, that you were making. I think it is the ability to integrate um, the skills that are going to be needed to be able to fill the jobs that we're seeing on the horizon that we expect to stay or grow. Um, those decision making, those analytical skills, um, those people skills, the ones I was talking about. How, you know, what are the predictors? What are the measurements? In other words, we're saying decision making, and, and, and that's a workplace skill we need. That's one of the things we're actually looking at. So, what does that mean? How do we measure it? How do we inform people, and how do we help them develop it? That's exactly what we have to do on the skill side. And then, how do we take those things and integrate it? you know, into the education system. So you're developing both. It's not that you want to take away from academic development, but you've got, we have to find a way to better prepare people with the skill set they need, the, hum, the humanity skill set, how even, I was calling them those four different skills that the employers identified. Um, yeah, and that's exactly what we're working on because it is going to be different than what we've seen and, and the ability to prepare people for that. Um, I think is critically um, important. I don't know if other colleagues want to add. You know, <clears throat> sort of talk about both of those points. Um, my mother would never forgive me if I didn't pay honor and respect to education, right? Education is important. Degrees are important, but skills and competencies are even more important today. Um, or maybe not more important, but certainly as important. And in some industries, they are more important. Some employers want to know what you can do. They don't want to know that you spent four years in school and don't know your way around a biotech lab and can ruin $20,000 worth of equipment, or you don't know what you're doing when you're climbing one of those towers to install things. Um, you know, so education is important. Skills and competencies and the credentials that demonstrate those skills and competencies are very important. And I would, I would hope that those employers in those conversations, matter of fact, I know your team is working on that, Governor, because we hear about the great things that are going on here. Uh, in Kentucky, not necessarily here too, but also in Kentucky. And you know, one of I think important things that that you all have worked on is creating an infrastructure so people can learn and acquire skills and credentials, right? And so it's you know developing. I mean, these are workforce labels, but career pathways, industry sector partnerships, apprenticeships. Um, where people have a pathway to get to whatever the skill needs are of the future, right? So we have an infrastructure that articulates clearly from 10th grade to 12th grade into the community college, into the four-year, into the apprenticeship program, which, by the way, apprenticeship, as Secretary Perez is wont to say, is, uh, you know, a college degree except without the debt. Um, so, you know, there, and, and it is true, and, and I will tell you the results of apprenticeship, since you asked, since you didn't ask, I will tell you, 
more people complete apprenticeships in community colleges and more people complete apprenticeships in four-year schools. And their average wage, wages when they get completed with apprenticeships are $50,000 a year, if not more. Whether the union or non-union doesn't really matter. They don't only just have to be in construction trades and manufacturing. Matter of fact, there's some pretty exciting things going on in engineering and STEM and IT and cyber and dental hygienists. And it is a learning and earning model that works and the data is incontrovertible, incontrovertible about that. So creating those statewide infrastructures where things are stackable, articulate with each other, where you're getting the business intelligence while you're working the workforce supply chain, right, and making sure that that's okay. And, you know, there's more ways, more than one way to skin this workforce training and skills cat. And that's not to diminish, Charles, I think what you said, which was very important too, but, you know, the, the linear pathway to college is just not happening for most of our young and old people anymore, right? And what's the average age in community college nowadays is 28, 30 years old. They're veterans coming back to the workforce or people have been laid off and haven't recovered from the recession yet there's people coming out of jail there's you know there's a lot of different diverse folks in the workforce so are those systems in place those on ramps and off ramps where people can get on and get the skills that they need depending upon what the labor market or more so what the employers are telling you what they need so there's lots of ways to do that and i think you know, we've got to do a better job with parents, a better job with teachers, a better job with counselors, a better jobs in our one-stop employment centers uh, to make sure people know that. Lastly, I'll say this, uh, it won't be the last thing I say, but for this moment, um, you know, a new law passed, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, a very large, confusing law, but changing the public workforce system. I know you all are working very hard on it in the states right now. I'm happy to talk to you after about this as I run out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> it is very complex, but, but what the new law is asking folks to do, particularly governors and states, is to be much more strategic about workforce development policy. Don't just worry about the law and the performance and the metrics of that particular law, but to think strategically across state agencies, across educational institutions, across the demands from the workforce, and to think more strategically and plan more strategically for those things, and to engage business and let business lead the way in those things. Puerto Rico, I, I looked at your numbers too. It's about 170,000 jobs in your top 10 that could be impacted by just the stuff we talked about today. But any reaction? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in Dr. Walden's uh, thinking of the retraining vouchers instead of the unemployment uh, payments. And that's something that uh, I think that we should do. Uh, can you give me an example? If anywhere in the 50 states that has been implemented and is it working right now or how, how is your idea coming about? Uh, uh, not my idea, in fact a, <clears throat> a colleague of mine probably 35 years ago, uh, Bob Fern, uh, first job was with the CIA, I don't know if that matters, um, um, was the person that at least I learned that from. I'm not, sh I'm not aware of any states that, that implement that. Um, I, I could, yes, yes, please. So we do, we do. Okay, sorry. It's in most states, it's called the RESEA program. It's operated through unemployment insurance. Uh, different states operate it differently, but we give out a lot of grants in that. It's a, it's a child of the recession when old, the unemployment, your father's unemployment system was mm -hmm. inadequate to deal with the needs. Um, and how are we going to get people not just give them the insurance that they're entitled to because they've been paying into it all their lives, but that's not enough to get them engaged and back in the workforce. So it's called reemployment assistance or reemployment services to get them involved with the uh, statewide one-stop systems, get them in, require them folks to come in, get it registered, get an assessment, and get opportunities for training, retooling, whatever their particular needs are. So different states operate it differently, but there's a lot of dollars that Department of Labor flows to the states to do those programs. Because I think there's a right? they're, they're flexible with the little bit more out. flexible. You know, nothing we do is all that flexible, but we're trying, <laughs> okay. right? We're trying. Uh, but, but, but we're tr we're, <laughs> look, we're, tr we're trying, right? And 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 that I think is an innovation in the unemployment insurance system that I think is helping a lot of people and you know our budget is trying to reflect more of that in the future because it's working. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. How about over here? Any uh, any reactions or ideas? And I'll go stand in front of this camera because that guy's mad at me for a while. Yeah, this is on. Yeah. yeah so uh, with the state of Georgia right. governor's office, uh, we've we've done a couple interesting things, and uh, you know s several years ago we looking at our unemployment rate, it's seven seven and a half eight percent. We Obviously, we need to work on fixing that, yeah. yeah. And we got jobs available. How do we fix that? So 
what we did is we got our uh, college system, our technical college system, our Department of Economic Development, and uh, we, we engaged the business community, uh, like you suggested, and, and uh, uh, we call that the High Demand Career Initiative. And uh, what we got out of that was um, we developed a set of grants called the Strategic Industries uh, Workforce Development Grants. Yep. And uh, what we're doing there is we have jobs available, but we don't have um, people that, that are qualified for them, just exactly like we discussed. So now um, if you go into one of these fields, well, your, your tuition is going to be paid. So now you can get that CDL. You can uh, become a practical nurse. Oh, we just added, um, you know, we're the number three state now for uh, the film industry. And so we added set design here this this last year. So we're trying to look at some innovative ways um, where we can train people the right way. And also in the high schools as well, we're seeing more and more college and career academies um, sprouting up as, as charter schools. Right. And uh, change that dialogue that you don't have to go to college to mm -hmm. be successful. There, there, there's other paths you can take. And uh, so that's been, been really interesting here in our state and also working uh, with the military community as well because right. they've got a lot of skills and they come back home and it's not always easy to find a job. So we're trying to match up where their skills are and make things a lot easier, mostly within uh, licensing, making licensing a lot easier for them. And uh, so those are a couple of programs that have been pretty successful in our state of uh, Georgia. And and I think we touched on it briefly, but uh, I, I work a lot with the governor, uh, with Governor Deal, who's put a special emphasis on criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we touched on it briefly with, uh, you know, folks coming out of prison, coming out of jail, looking for jobs. So uh, our most recent phase of criminal justice reform was focusing on reentry. Um, and we've now started, we've established a couple different charter uh, high schools within the prisons. So they're not getting just GEDs. They're getting an actual high school diploma. Um, and I've also started on vocational training toward uh, things that are high demand currently. Um, and you know, all this is geared towards not necessarily workforce issues, although that's a side benefit, but getting down recidivism rates too. Right. Um, you know, we found a lot of uh, willing participants, uh, with, especially with the vocational training, um, in our prisons, uh, and, and it's, been a good success for us so far um, but you know just the general talking about retraining for new jobs uh, it's really sort of a parallel uh, idea to retraining folks who've um, you know been out of the workforce for a long time. No, the flexibility of the systems is, right. is exactly the same. Yeah. Anthony you want to talk from Arkansas for a minute? Yes and I, I, I speak more from the K-12 education side than I do the uh, current um, industrial side but that is part of my Part of my work as coordinator for computer science for the state. But really, our focus as a state has shifted to creating a generation of problem solvers. Uh, and we, a lot of us, realize that that's best conducted through our STEM initiatives out there. Now, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics have, have been around, as, as has been witnessed there. Uh, you know, the new field that Governor Hutchinson and our state sees as really meeting the demand are, are reaching our current generation of students is through our computer science initiative. And that's further supported by the, the federal governments and President Obama's uh, recent signing of the STEM Education Act of 2015, which now identifies computer science as a STEM uh, subject area for National Science Foundation. Really, our focus on computer science is intended to do three things. Uh, as I said, one, it gives our students um, another avenue um, to find K-12 success. That's our first purpose of computer science in the state of Arkansas and pushing it as a statewide initiative. Our second is to convert our students from being simply consumers of technology to producers of their own technology, as was mentioned earlier with the uh, 3D manufacturing. But you know, how many students carry around one of these that have more computing power than a lot of desktops that are sitting on many of our rural schools across, across the nation? Sure. And they can, they can create their own technology that they're going to consume. And then three, as I said, really the, the ultimate end goal here is to uh, use a relevant technology to create the problem solvers and the critical think or the analytical thinkers, that, that term's been thrown around a lot, but really those analytical thinkers needed for that pipeline into our Arkansas industries. Governor Hutchinson has, has said that he wants Arkansas to be the, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, you know, th on this side of the United States, and we are working very hard toward that. And you know, while we know that there will be some technological displacement within industry, 
we're embracing that wholeheartedly as a state and, and looking to outfit our current generation of K-12 students with the skills needed to step into those higher end jobs as they become available. Thanks. Yep. Key point that we've all kind of touched on that we keep coming back to in the secretary, and I think Chuck really nailed it on the head that I would hate for us to change subjects without reinforcing this and this is something that you've educated me about for quite some time and that's everything that we've talked about all is tied back to the system the system and in our individual states meeting it both from a demand and a supplied side that integrates these pieces that we know regardless of what happens with technology even when we're trying and we're sitting down and we're meeting specific skill sets of business and industry Time and time again, the feedback that we've gotten from HR managers, CEOs, and plant folks are like, look, we wish you would do a couple of things for us. Create the system that actually rewards some of the things that we're doing. Make sure that this was integrated as a part of your workforce or educational system inside your own area. I'll teach my workers my particular gadget, but bring me that individual that has the applied technology skills. It's not afraid of the technology that you mentioned to code at the age of 12 years old, right? Let that be the system and that baseline can adapt to any changing market or any changing technology impact as it relates to the economy. And that's a, that is a big missing piece, particularly in the southern economy, is that every one of our states are trying to still tackle this with systems on top of systems. Yep. And so they're integrating all of these systems together to meet that demand of business and industry that's integrated from K through 12 all the way through. In fact, one of our governors uh, in, says it's really K through J, right? Not K through 12 or K through 14, but it's K through J, K through job. Yep. All through the whole pathway, regardless of what that exit or on-ramp may be. Yeah, I told Chris a lot, I get in trouble, and it usually helps you look better when I, when I go out and say there's never been a system. Hey, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, you know, there's never been a system. There's just been a bunch of programs that we call a system that there's nothing systemic about them. There's no pathways between them. Anyway, getting better. I mean, I work, I'm old enough to have worked on JTPA when it was a mess. So I, mean, I go all the way back, but we're getting better, but there's still, still a group of different things that we haven't connected yet. I want to I will warn the audience, we're coming to you right after this next round to ask you questions, but I want to touch the place-based thing for a minute because with rural, it's become more, so much more acute in the South, and we like to talk about the South looking different. Southern states and, 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 and you know, Puerto Rico even, to the extent that we weren't, we're not the Northeast, we're not all one big megalopolis, and we're not the West where you have a big town and then 60 miles of nothing and then another town. We're our development patterns in the South are lots of little places that used to be economically viable and struggle today to be economically viable in the future. And as things change, I mean, Eastern Kentucky was very economically viable. And for, you know, for a minute, you look up and it's changed. How do, you know, we've got rural counties, rural cities, and, and, I, and I agree with you, Chuck, Micropolitans is where I think the, the action is. Uh, how is the technology shifts and the job shifts really going to impact those places? First of all, I'm here with one of my policy heroes, uh, Governor Bashir, but Governor Winters was another one. And he had a great saying, uh, the road out of poverty winds through the schoolyard. Yeah. And that was a great metaphor in 1968, but today it's to a system, exactly what this gentleman here said. Um, I'm convinced that the collective impact model is the only model in a spatially extended, low capacity rural place. And I was honored to work with the governor on the SOAR initiative in Eastern Kentucky, 60 counties. It was essentially a mini DRA. But the key is that every sector gets involved in that system. What I worry about STEM is that we leave the A out. The arts are amazingly critical because in early childhood brain theory, we learn the two sides, the artistic side and the engineering side, talk to one or in, an, in unique ways. Some of our greatest artists are engineers, but they have to all be in systems. And I, I really think getting to the integrated alignment around rural stuff is critical. That's gonna mean a rural urban alliance. And these micro cities are the, are the they are the anchor tenants for every one of the major institutions, entrepreneurship. And I'll say one last thing, we're talking about workforce. 
but we need a kid in the Delta when she's seven to decide she's going to own a business, not work for one. And that is the cultural and life thing as well, beyond the other skills. So I think anything we can do, and I think SGA is a great example to build collaborative, collective model impacts, and, and frankly, this administration has done more for place-based policy than a president in that town for 50 years. We're on to it now, and it's starting to live out granularly in an awful lot of places. COGS are doing it, counties are doing it, development organizations are doing it, now the feds are doing it, and I think governors are more and more doing it. Every rural region is different because every rural place is different. What works in the West isn't going to work in Mississippi, but we have to recognize we really need to raise the scale of what that place is beyond just that community to that region. And align those assets. For Correct. Carter, Carter, you had a question. Yeah. Start talking and see if it works. Let's okay. Will it work? Okay. Yeah, there's a guy in the back that flips them <laughs> on oh, and off. Okay. And, you know. <laughs> um, I just, uh, in Puerto Rico, um, on, that, on that note, um, there's been a lot of talk about being disruptive and that technology is being disruptive to labor. So I just wanted to throw in what was the take in regards on being disruptive versus being adaptive? Um, just, just throwing that out there. That's a great question. Um, because that's something that we're doing in Puerto Rico, and I'm guessing that, that the other states as well. Um, so just throwing it out, out there, disruptive versus adaptive. Yeah. An anybody think the technology is not disruptive everywhere it ends up? I mean, how do we, how do we make it both of those things? Because it's going to be disruptive, right? I think your story on the Luddites, if I remember right, it was the guilds back then that <coughs> organized the, the initial riots because it was minimizing their advantage of skills that the machine had just taken away and therefore their economic advantage. And so they organized that. So it disrupts. How do we, how do we get the good side out of it? Well, this may, this may not be a very provocative answer, but I think um, <clears throat> um, technology disrupts. We have to respond to that. Uh, and the response has to be to adapt to the technology. So, for example, when technology came to the farm, that released, released millions of, in many cases, illiterate farmers, uh, that's when we really started to put a foot, we the country, put a focus on education. Uh, the southern states, in, in particular, started to do that. And so, again, in North Carolina, our high school graduation, race, graduation rates soared, and that gave those displace farmers an ability to then work in the factory where they often had to read plans and, and work machinery and, 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 and follow directions, et cetera. Quite frankly, a lot of them migrated away from the South to the North. So um, I think the disruption comes first, and I think one of, the, one of the points that I tried to make, and maybe not very well, is if we can identify that disrupt disruption early enough, then we can set in place the, the adaption part and figure out what we need to do, for example, policy-wise, in order to take that disruption and, and, and deal with it. Then one last thing I'm going to say, I, 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 I was thinking about this, and I'm worried that, that I was too negative on technology. We have, to, we have to remember all the great things technology does for us, and it's not just watching videos and sending texts and emails. Um, if you read the literature, for example, on how we're going to deal with uh, uh, challenges in the environment, in energy, in water. Um, North Carolina's population, for example, is going to grow by 30 percent. Where are we going to get the water? Uh, it's in technology. It's in terms of becoming more efficient, more efficient users of natural resources. So technology is, is crucial to make technological advances. But in terms of the workforce, identifying that disruption early enough to give us adequate time to figure out how to adapt. There's a, yeah, please jump in. Economic developer practitioner hat on a minute, and uh, I think, at least from some of the things that we've seen, Chuck, in in the rural piece, this this piece about technology being disruptive or adaptive, it really is a generational issue. It's an age issue. The millennial workforce that is emerging, particularly in rural America, it is smooth sailing. This this idea of innovation, they actually are ch are challenging us, and I and I guess, you know, I'm 42. And I, I have a hard time with don't, don't, the technology piece. Not, no, but so. the majority of the people who work for DRA are millennials. 
and they run circles around me. They're, they're pushing me, why are we not doing ABC as it relates to technology? And I really think we're seeing that with some economic development projects in rural America across the board as it relates to, to adapting to technology. And they're asking, why are you not doing this, Rural City X? You could be doing ABC even more if you would just automate your permitting process at your, for the local city council. So I, I think, actually, we welcome that, at least I do from my position, and some of the issues that we're tackling. We, we think that we can actually leverage technology and innovation to, to address some of the challenges that we have. Let's see if we go back down the mic here. I don't know. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we did in Puerto Rico uh, with our Department of Agriculture was actually to implement uh, an online platform to change the way that workers um, look for jobs in farms. So mm -hmm. we had this um, uh, web application where by using GPS, we were able to identify the sectors where they were looking for employment in that area. So we adapted an existing model of uh, going into offices and um, uh, used an online platform. So I, I, that's, I just wanted to take uh, half your take on it and then also provide an example for something that we did in Puerto Rico that's been that's really successful because now we're much more data driven in the sense that we can instantly know which farm or which sector is creating jobs. Um, so just enabling technology and, and using technology to enable uh, job creation. Just wanted to take your, 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 your take on it. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> want to tackle that? Well, I want to say, go yeah, ahead. No, 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 no. Ahead, I want to say one last thing, just a cautionary tale. If we don't get rural broadband across this country, right. none of this works. Yeah. And um, it's more important yeah. than electricity was because you could milk the cows by hand. <laughs> and the milk and machine helped. But if you do not have broadband, we are creating an underclass spatially that we will never recover from because those young people in those rural schools got it here. They need it unbundled in their community. This should be the driver for this nation, frankly. Second thing, just on the rural-urban interface, we have to convince urban constituents of yours that their future is tied to a strong leadership in rural because everyone, every one of the resources that we must sustain from natural disaster, challenge in climate, terrorism, and frankly, continuing production for the cities is in an urban space. And the young generation wants to stay there. I don't care what field you're in, the literature on, on nurses say is, if you get a degree from a community college, you have an 80% chance of ending your career, Governor, within 30 miles of that school. There is an, <clears throat> Chancellor of our university was an economist, and he had a great thesis on the amenity wage in Appalachian. What it said was, how much less will an Appalachian ta <coughs> kid take throughout his career to stay home? We are very close to totally evening that. If we don't get broadband, nothing we're talking about here works, period. Let me just make a comment on the broadband situation. Uh, Chuck couldn't be more right and that, you know, Kentucky right now, I think is dead last in the, in the country in terms of speed of, of delivery in the broadband area. We just uh, signed up the biggest uh, P3 project in Kentucky's history. Uh, it's going to be about a 300 and fifty million dollar project about sixty million of it is from the government and the rest of it is private equity to build out thirty four hundred miles of high-speed broadband fiber the middle mile yep. it, to every community in the commonwealth and then the last mile obviously is going from where that ends into businesses and homes in that community. And that's going to depend upon your local telcos and cable companies and all of that. But, I mean, this is going to be a game changer 
uh, for rural America. I mean, this is going to be a game changer for Eastern Kentucky. And it's uh, one of the priorities in your new strategic plan too, Chris. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, when, when, you, when you do that, because, look, I've told communities over and over again, I can't guarantee you that if you ha have a high-speed broadband that we can create jobs in your community, but I can almost guarantee that if you don't have it, we can't. No, it's the ante of today's uh, uh, infrastructure. To your point on disruption, I, just one thing to throw it back in there, there's a, there's a psychology of uncertainty principle that happens with people. If, if they don't know what to expect, then they fear it, and they fear it a lot and they tend to hide from it and they do things. I mean, every one of us, how many people in the room have a cell phone that's more than two years old? Right, look around. So we've all been disruptive, right? <laughs> Technology disruption is not a bad thing, but, but Apple or whoever told us how wonderful it was going to be, and we bought it, right? So in, in a community where if we flash one of those slides up that says 47% of all jobs will be computerized out of existence, and it's on the front page of USA Today, then our citizens go berserk. But if we tell them what that means for the future, what you haven't, you haven't heard Armageddon here today, you've heard you've got to do things. And that's where leadership and policy leadership comes into play, is by changing the uncertain, there's no way to predict the future, we none of us do that, and, and most people get that. But fearing an uncertainty is a very different thing than planning for change. Right, and that, I think that's the key for that. Let's open up to the room for a minute for anybody on the panel or any comments, and we have microphones, and as you can tell, there's lots of TV cameras, so you have to pop up, and we have to do that. So run, let's, we, as soon as you get a mic, just jump in. Yes, um, and tell us who you are, because then we'll put it under is your Is this name. on? I don't think, to, is it on? I can't. Yep, you're okay. perfect. I'm Mike Galeazzo from Maryland Regional Manufacturing Institute. And I do want to thank this association for having this topic. It's one that I'm very familiar with. And I do want to get back to the systemic issue that you here's talked about, Ted, yep. because a, a couple of things, uh, and I'm very interested in the data, but I know that you mentioned the, the, the jobs where we may not have work, mm -hmm. and then you talked about the jobs where we may have work. Well, what about the fact that in a country where we have 62% job participation rate mm -hmm. before this tsunami hits? Yep, absolutely. Who's going to be able to afford to go to the massage therapist or <laughs> even to the hospital? And I mean, that, that's just one point that I want to point out. This is real. This yep. isn't, it may happen. Uh, if you read the folks that have really have been investing, involved in this, it's for real, and I would agree, it's not a workforce issue. I don't think it's a technology issue. I think it's Save America issue. I'm really, I really do believe that, because we know what kind of country do we have if you have life, liberty, but you can't pursue happiness because you don't have a job. And that's fun, and I'm not, this is not a scare no. tactic. No. And you haven't mentioned, Michael, you didn't, I know you touched on artificial intelligence, yeah. but that's gonna be the real killer. And a lot of people don't understand the impact of that technology, not just on routine work, that's on white, white collar work. I know it wasn't a question, but I wanted to compliment. But the thing about will we have anybody that's going to be able to afford to, to go to these services that are being provided with the few occupations that you say may survive? Yeah, about 702 occupations, and I've talked about 20 on the end, so all those in the middle are fun too, so we'll get there. Yes, sir, and we'll run over a thing to you too. Hi, Ted. Thank you. Uh, Jack Sullivan, Florida Research Consortium. Thanks Good to see you here. again. Nice to be here. Uh, so everybody in the room has agreed that disruption is coming, but it seems that we've sort of touched tactically on what to do about it mm -hmm. sort of after the fact. And it, and it seems we ought to have the discussion of do we want to be the disrupted or do we want to be the disruptor? Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're the disruptor, then I think you're in a position where you're going to create more jobs than, in fact, you're losing. And I think that's how we need to reframe the discussion and think of the characteristics of an economy that uh, ultimately can create more jobs and can be a disruptive economy versus a disrupted economy. Yep. To, I know that Diane would say that part of SGA's role in life is to figure out, you just described a set of winners and losers in a pretty competitive marketplace that's changing rapidly. How do we help southern states be the disruptors that get in and win? That's the question, is what can we do? I think what you heard, some tactical things around the way you train people and do stuff, but 
I, you know, I've been, nobody's used it exactly, but demand-driven focus on workforce development, and Chris, you mentioned it that way. I mean, I see that change, and Mr. Secretary, I know you, that's been, that's been a subtle change of the language, at least, is, is what I hear. It's been going on for 10, 12 years, thinking yeah. about demand-driven, it has really taken hold, and anybody in the workforce or education space needs to be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, particularly in the education space, right? Uh, need to be informed what's going on in industry, needs to be informed what's going, uh, you know, the, the skills and credentials, of course, but where industry is going. You know, we, we can't teach the workers of tomorrow, you know, you today's know. stuff today the for tomorrow, right? It, right? You know, I, I would also want to say that, you know, my mother called me disruptive when I was a kid, so I don't <laughs> know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's used as a good thing. I'm, I'm not always sure about that, but, but disruption is everywhere. You're going to have a group launch code here tomorrow, right? Yep. And launch code and groups like that across the country are very disruptive in the education and training space. Anybody can do code now, right? I'm exaggerating only slightly, but teaching people who never thought of thought that they could do coding to do, sure. you know, computer programming, that sort of work. I think the, that all needs to shake out over time, but that will be an innovative group that, that is speaking to you tomorrow. Raise your hand if you've got a question in the audience, because it's bright up here. <laughs> so let me, let me do a couple things, questions for you guys. Uh, who's more scared than when they walked in? <laughs> Okay, good. a couple, okay, well good. I mean, we, we want to provoke a few people, but who believes that this is a yes. <laughs> call to action? I mean, I, th I think the one thing, no, nobody, by the way, everybody in this room, tomorrow and the next day and Monday will be doing stuff to address all this. I mean, you know, we, we all go to work every day and that's what all, most of y'all are doing, is trying to fix these issues. The question is, for your collective impact is, are there things we can do collectively that buttress us against these issues? Because they're out there. Uh, when, you look, when ACT looks at the future, you know, you're, you're finding skills and you've, you've sorted them in, but is, is, are we making enough progress fast enough? What do we need to do? Um, no. <laughs> we are not, but we can do things. One of the things that we've been doing, and I think it's an area that, that um, I've been fortunate enough to have um, to be able to lead, is moving from just understanding we have a problem to really beginning to solve a problem. And I can't agree with you more on this urban rural. It's really building um, communities, regions. It's building, fo you know, creating um, partnerships of folks working together. Um, to solve a problem. Um, the space that I'm bringing into this collaboration is measuring of skills. Um, we have a, the opportunity to work with industry to create a common language of what are the skills that they need and what are the level they need of proficiency. And then we have the opportunity to help people measure what their skills are and to match people to jobs. Okay, that's the tactical side. But the really big thing we're doing in communities is skilling them up. We cannot skill up a community. We can't skill up a worker unless people know what it means to be a skilled worker. And that is the fundamental essence of what ACT is doing with Work Ready Communities, is helping communities understand what's the skill level needed and what are people measuring in those skill levels and then working with the policy leaders in a community to close the skills gap. Every month we provide data in every county across the country on how many people improved their skill level. Hugely important, particularly in rural America, for solving the skills gap. When I say that it's not looking good, oh. it's because I see the data. I, I don't like to talk about it all the time. I like to just solve the problem. But I can tell you the number of high school students at a proficiency, a problem-solving proficiency needed for the future might be 15%. Think about that. It's less than college readiness. And that's what we're doing community by community. And Governor, I commend Kentucky for the work that you're doing as well, you know, in, in working in this area. And Missouri and all of the other, Arkansas, all the states are working with the Delta Regional Authority. This is the hardest work communities ever will do. But it's disruptive. It's a positive disruptive. Because if you can create a common language and employers are going into the to communities and telling this is what we need the skill level to be. And it's not a K-12 system at a state level that's making these decisions. It's, it's the K-12 system in the community because they are dependent upon that company's 
tax dollars to keep their school operational, and they want to be able to supply the workforce. And that's where the change is happening. So it, it's disruptive, but a positive disruptive, because if we can help, I go back to the very beginning thing I had talked about, if we can help communicate what are the skills employers need, which are not necessarily defined academically, they're defined, you know, personal, people, applied, workplace, but if we can create a common language of what's needed at what level, and then we can work with the education community, that's what we're doing in these communities. Let's take technology, let's get it into the K-12 classroom, let's bring it in at younger ages, and let's equip teachers better to integrate skills into an academic curriculum. So it's disruptive, but it's, um, what was the word, I'm sorry, you used? Adaptive. I love that word, adaptive. And so, you know, I'm very, ho I'm very hopeful and watching the amount of energy, synergy, and the number of people across this country rolling up their sleeves and getting work done. So, and I'm just going to commend the chairman here before I'm quiet, move on, because he's one of the most outstanding leaders in eight states that I've seen. And I've got to tell you, this chairman has rolled his sleeves up with counties all across the Delta Regional Authority, and it's a rare type of leadership we see. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've got time for one more from the audience, if you have one. <coughs> yes, please, Jeff. Just, just a, uh, a quick question. Knowing the challenges that are ahead of us, knowing we need to train students to be really nimble and resilient in the economy of the future, uh, where is government inefficient or, or spending money? Where is it spending money today that doesn't, that yeah. doesn't, and knowing that resources are finite, where it should instead be allocating it to a different area? Where are we inefficient or not as wise as we should be? Okay, Ted, you're probably, right. probably never going to get invited again, and hopefully That's the governor right. will, will protect me because this is some, sometimes who are. I uh, get crossed a little bit with education a little bit, and part of it, uh, and the governors are really the ones that show real leadership on this. And, and Jeff, you, to your point, I, I would say there's really two things, I think, that are real barriers to what's happening. One is when it comes to realigning relationships and resources. In a lot of our communities, we're still dealing with the same model and trying to do 21st century economic development and workforce training on a 20th century model fundamentally how we fund those particular entities, those organizations, those, those workforce training, and it could be the two-year or the technical colleges. Uh, we've been dealing with this in Arkansas specifically. For example, we don't have a mechanism in Arkansas where we can reward a program that is trying to address specific need for business and industry because the money follows butts and seats. And there's not a way to, to adjust that where we can be so responsive so quickly to the needs of business and industry. We're, we're hamstrung. We see that a lot in a lot of our rural communities, that the educational model is not nimble, adaptive, or can be responsive to any change in the marketplace or any change in the technology. It's very, very difficult. And the policies that are coming out of our state legislature sometimes actually does not support that. So when you have governors like Governor Nixon and Governor Brashears here who are really models across the nation on this issue, and, and one of the things, Deborah, that you said that I think is probably the most powerful as it relates to this process is that this is not just one specific process addressing one particular need. This is about a platform that is bringing everybody to the table of all stakeholders, K through 12, secondary business and industry, the workforce training folks, government, policy makers, NGOs, and going, look, here's what the people who are providing the checks for our people to have a quality of life. Here are these issues. This is the one platform, regardless of the local strategy you're trying to accomplish, if it's increasing your high school graduation rates or you're trying to do one particular workforce training program to meet a particular need, it doesn't matter. This platform gives them the ability to do that. But the biggest hurdle, Jeff, back to your question, is are we supporting the policies and the funding mechanisms that actually allows the system to be created that's linked, connected, and can be nimble to that effect? But, but first there. Okay, uh, that's an excellent question. And it sort of scares me a little bit, right? Because that's a disruptive question to us, right? So uh, 
you know, if Secretary Perez would hear, he'd say, you know, we've done way too much in training and praying, right? Training people and praying that they get a job. And we've got to go to training and placing people in jobs that are in demand that employers want. And our, our, our highway of workforce development programs is littered with these half-baked programs that have thrown little bits of training at people over time that have not been business driven, that have not led to skills and credentials. So that's sort of one issue. We're smarter, we're more targeted, we're more data driven. We're more, we should be more regional and focused because what happens in Eastern Kentucky and Western Kentucky, two different labor markets, two different things yeah. going on there, right? So we need to be looking at the real time uh, labor market data on that. Uh, we need to not train and pray anymore. But there's a couple of solid things we've been doing for years in this country that we have sort of given up on or undervalued. Career and technical education starting in high schools and continuing on in community colleges. We've given up on that. We've undervalued that. We haven't given up, but it's been undervalued across the country. Apprenticeship, it's a model that all of the day, the most successful workforce program of all time, and we have undervalued it. Less than 1% of our population is doing apprenticeships. Go to Switzerland, Germany, UK, anywhere else you know, 40, 50, 60%, and their employers are lining up to get engaged with the high schools to do it, right? In this country, the average age of apprenticeships is tw apprentices is 27, 28 years old. In Switzerland, it's 17. And guess what? An apprenticeship, can you can go on to a technical school or community college or four-year. And so it's a permeable system in which you can do those things. Kentucky is experimenting with a lot of that in youthful apprenticeships right now. But there's some basics that we've given up on, and I, and I really do think, you know, these more uh, work-based learning, these continuum of work-based learning, whether it's internships, on-the-job training, or the granddaddy of them all, apprenticeship, need to be integrated back into workforce programs we've just gotten away from. Again, whether it's technology, education, skills, or the conversion of all those things, those things will be helpful. And I really think, you know, as matters of policy, whether it's you're talking to state legislatures or state workforce boards or economic development councils, need to be thinking about what really has worked over the years that we went away from that we need to go back to today. I got the sign from the back, so I'm going to let you close this out, Mike. Okay. I'm going to answer that question very specifically. <clears throat> States deal with set budgets each year, unlike the federal government, which can borrow to meet its operating needs. States deal with set budgets. Um, and again, I'll use my state as an example. <clears throat> if I had a magic wand to wave, I would dramatically shift resources to pre-K to 12, uh, something like a 30 percent increase. So we have individuals graduating from high school that are ready to go don't need remedial training. I would definitely bring in a greater business and private funding presence to both community colleges and four-year institutions because probably what's going to happen there is the funding that I want to increase at pre-K through 12, some of that's going to come from higher education. So we have to replace those resources. I would do, I would do that through private resources. I would try to bend the cost curve in uh, health care expenditures at the state level, and I would privatize uh, largely uh, 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 transportation, uh, get it out of the state budget, uh, user fees, private construction of roads, bridges, et cetera. I'm not running for anything, so I can say all that. <laughs> Can I just do a friendly amendment to Jeff's question? Jeff, you said students very specifically in your question. And, and I think one of the challenges here is, is when we always have these workforce conversations, it's not just about students, right? It's about veterans coming back. It's about, you know, the adults in eastern Kentucky. It's about the financial analyst in the, New the Jersey who's st still yeah. out of work. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really is a much larger problem. Than, and, and true, the, the, the K-12 to issues are challenging. But we always think of students. And what I want to do is think about that paradigm very differently as a continuum of not just students. But people who fall out of college, fall out of community college, fall out of a job, you know, a variety of other ways. Uh, they're all challenges to the state workforce folks and education folks who are working with them. For those of you who have been coming to SGA for a long time, I hope you enjoy the more interactive nature of the way we're trying to do this. This is problem solving as a group. If we could get collective agreement here, we, we, might, we might need the model for that. <laughs> I want you to first, uh, let's thank the panel. Yeah, Good job. Show hands and pray. And I think y'all held up to the big brain stuff pretty good, I think. 15-minute break in the hall. Uh, back out here in the foyer where you were. 15-minute break, come back and let's talk about what the markets are doing to energy.